I thought we'd come back to the whiteboard for something I just kind of thought about, a deep dive into the anatomy of a stage win. Now we'll start with the obvious. It helps when you have one of the strongest guys in the race when you're making a plan. We had Paddy Bevan, great form, showed that on the mountaintop finish in Turkey with a second place. And then on stage six, the sprint, uphill sprint was fourth behind the climbing sprinters. But we had an 11 second deficit that we needed to turn around. Intermediate bonus sprints were not gonna be enough. We couldn't rely on a stage win in a sprint because of the caliber of sprinters that were in that race. So we had to really think outside the box as a team and utilize what we had, which will become quite laughable at some point. But we'll do a deep dive into it not up until, not this bit, we won't do this bit because that's that was all down to Paddy. Paddy versus Jay Vine and Nicholas a day in sort of the bolt to the line. The bit we're going to dive into is how we got Paddy into a position as a team to launch him off the front. Now the stage was 130k, which is short, which is short. And the good thing about short stages is it's difficult for any team to control. And the reason for that is there's like, fatigue was and wasn't. A factor in in this race it's not so much of a factor you know the stage is short we're not four or five hours deep into a race so there's a lot people are a lot more enthusiastic towards the end of a short stage than they are like something that begins with a two but it was stage seven so there is fatigue in everyone's legs you know it, it had not been an easy tour of turkey the plan at the start was to make sure that there was a, a controllable breakaway ideally no more than seven riders ideally no world tour teams because we knew the world tour teams would be the guys that want to be able to control this race so we're all chinning around making sure that bora don't move helps and fenix don't move bike exchange uh, Lotto Sudel and a couple of others making sure that they are not going up the road. Once we got to that point we immediately put Itamar Einhorn, our sprinter, but on a day like today we're not interested in the sprint. He started to ride to control the front so we showed willingness to want to be able to take this race on by immediately going there and putting a guy to help work. Lotto Sudel went to help and Alperson Fenix did as well. So there's three strong guys here controlling this climb, this climb, and then the first hint of a team wanting chaos came on the downhill when Bora, uh, all along here, super technical, super narrow roads, we were ready for it, we're all in position, and that's one of the things about riding in the front. In those unwritten rules of cycling, if you've got a guy riding in the front, that gives you the right, as a team, to be near the front. And the further back you go, the more you have the yo-yo effect, the more it sort of it kills your riders a bit. So with it and our ride in the front, we knew that we could sit up the front, stay out of trouble. So like I said, this was a very crashy race. We stay out of trouble and we conserve energy. That was sort of the first point. Bora then lit it up on the downhill. I think they just lit it up to cause some chaos and then see what comes of it. Nothing did, nothing did. I mean, it put everyone, it put the like scares up everyone because it was a very technical downhill, but ultimately nothing came of that chaos. But that suited us because we knew chaos was chaos was good for us because chaos is difficult for Androni with Eduardo Sabelda in Super Velda, sorry, in the leader's jersey. It's difficult for them to control. Now we're not going to wait till here because, like I said, good sprinters. Here was part of our plan, but here was the became apparent that this point exactly here was where the damage that needed to be done. Not the highest point of the race, the highest point was here, but this was the steepest climb of the race. And that meant we had to set things up before. What was asked of us was on this climb, which was about a 10 minute climb, five, six percent, flattened off a bit at the top, had a little, I forgot, did have a little dip in it. We wanted control, full control. We wanted to make life difficult. It was a narrow road, so it's difficult for teams to move up once everyone's in position. And that role fell to the three non-climbers in the team. Rick, Matthias and me and I cannot tell you how nervous we all were because I think for the first time in all of our careers we'd been asked to make life difficult on a climb but this was our finish line. It didn't really matter what happened after this point. Now we were taking a risk because by sacrifice, we'd already sacrificed Itamar to ride the front. We were one man down with Guy Niv who got sick and had to leave the race so that left and we were going to sacrifice Rick, Matthias and me still with 25k to go which had the potential, if it planned in work, to leave Paddy Bevan isolated, like Paddy and Corbin. And now if, if so, like Androni had a lot of climbers, so if we'd done all this and Androni still had six guys left, then we would be in trouble because they'd be able to control everything. So we really were taking a risk here. Now it's a 10 minute effort, nine minute effort, five or 6%, flattened off a little bit at the top, 
and Matthias and Rick's job was to do the first bit and yeah, we rode just shy of six watts per kilo average up this and like I said there was a dip so on the most part it was a little bit above six watts per kilo. Now that's difficult for everyone. Like, everyone's going to be in a bit of trouble. Not trouble, but everyone's going to be under the gun a little bit. Like whether If they're a very good climber, they're comfortable, but they're still having to push on the pedals here. For the non-climbers, there's guys going out the back, yeah, this is too hard, and more crucially, no one, it's much more difficult to move up, because obviously to move up, you've then got to ride faster than everyone else. You're going to be doing like six and a half, seven watts per kilo, which is less easy. So Rick and Burnley did the first bit. Now, Another big fear is another team having the same idea, same plan that you've got. Uno X had the same plan, but they were only willing to put one rider to work. So the minute that I took over near the top, we then put Uno X on the back foot and they, we had full control. Now a crucial thing about the top of the climb, where it flattens out, which is where I took over, I then I accelerated quite hard. There was about a, a two and a half or three minute stint of about 500 watts at the top here, which is like uh, 500 watts, just down seven-ish, just under seven-ish watts per kilo. It's flattened out, which means you accelerate. It means your speed is picking up. And what that means for anyone that's on the steeper section of climb, you're either pulling away from them or they're having to accelerate at the same rate as you, but they're having to accelerate on the steeper section of climb to maintain their position. So what we then see then is because that is like, highly difficult with the wattages that we're doing at the front you then see everyone start stretching out which is then when we start to get the desired effect of stretching the peloton like getting everyone in single file so that so that into the launch of Paddy everyone is as far behind him as they possibly can be as we head into the downhill and interestingly that is a tactic that's used quite common for teams that are riding the front so if you've got a, a team riding the front and it's quite a heli parkour once they get to the top of the climb, they'll accelerate pretty hard because these guys, they know that most of the peloton will still be on the incline, so they'll be having to accelerate at the same rate as like your Tim de Klerk, who's already in the downhill and doing 60k an hour. They're having to accelerate at the same rate as Tim, but they're still on the incline. So you can, if you're, if you're smart, you can really, even though you're the one riding the front, you can do some serious damage to the guys behind. Like I said, so here we've got everyone on the back foot. On the top bit, now we can see all this through Velo Viewer. the top bit was not a straight road. And the good thing about not being a straight road is if you've got the front, you can take well in your light to take the full racing line, which is apexes. Now, if at this point everyone, anyone wants to move forwards for the descent, it's gonna be very difficult because the minute they try and move up the right, I'm on the front heading towards the next apex, which is on the right. Then someone's gonna try coming up the left, same thing's gonna happen. So. They have to do even an almighty great big effort to sprint there quickly or it's just not going to happen. So the position that they take at the top of the climb is the position that they're going to enter the crucial steep bit of the climb with the bottom of the descent. And the next thing that we did was rail the downhill. Took some big risks. It really, really went fast on the downhill. You know, it's part of the race. Downhilling is a crucial, crucial part, and you're seeing Tour de Alps at the moment. Pelo Bilbao is a large part of the reason he's leading that race is due to his descending skills, as well as his being able to climb. So me with Paddy on my wheel, and crucially Corbin on Paddy's wheel, we railed this downhill. There's a narrow road, and with all the switchbacks, everyone is single file and a little bit spread out. Everyone's leaving one or two meter gaps. Now, I think you can see what's happening here. Anyone that's needing to stay with Paddy is suddenly actually on the road quite a long way behind. And now the last thing, the launch. This, the plan initially was for me to go a bit further, but the profile was deceiving in that this bottom section ramped straight into like six, nine, 12%. And then it was a more regular, I think another 10 minute climb. So at the bottom, I carried the speed as much as I could, knowing Paddy was on my wheel, taking him, I, I think I, it was a 25 second effort, around about 600-ish watts, so eight or nine watts per kilo, keeping Paddy on the wheel to keep that speed, and then I swing off, Paddy launches. And then the next thing, Corbin's on Paddy's wheel, so anyone wanting to go with Paddy has to then make up, immediately make up a bike length in Corbin. And if they're, that's presuming they're on Corbin's wheel. If they're further back, they've got to make up more bike lengths. And Paddy's not going slowly. So we've done 20 seconds at eight and a half watts per kilo, and then Paddy's just then settled in and kept the power down at a pace that like not many can hold. What we, interestingly on Strava, I noticed that 
Even Jay Vine, who was part, I think, on Corbin's will, who went to the climb, had to do the first minute 20 of this climb two seconds faster than Paddy did. Nicholas Aday, who ended up, uh, was part of the trio that went to the finish line, he had to do the first 20 minutes five seconds faster than Paddy did. And so you can imagine anyone that's even further back is having to go an awful lot faster on that climb than Paddy is, where the, you know, the speeds are now so slow that the slipstream drafting isn't really taking hold. And that is how we launched Paddy. And it was marvellous. Like I said, it could have easily not gone the way we were taking a big risk. And luckily, the, whole, the, the isolation problem came down to simply Paddy and two others, which clearly he'll can deal, he can deal with behind him. As we expected, the sprinters could climb. Caden Groves was there, uh, Jasper Philipson was there. So a group of 17 behind with Eduardo Superwelda, the leader's jersey, chasing as hard as he can, but not many, there wasn't good cohesion because there wasn't many teams that could, Eduardo only had one teammate with him. Jasper had Jay up the road, so he couldn't, it was difficult for him to work out what to do. There just wasn't an organised chase, which is what allowed Paddy to go to the line. Eurosport only showed the last kilometre. That was their highlights package. So this is why I'm telling you exactly what happened beforehand. Like the anatomy of, I think this, I found super fascinating after the race, because it was like, it was the way the really experienced directors are like, this is what I think we should do. And it's just that experience and foresight that it's difficult to get a hold of. And that's what makes a good director, I think. That's the anatomy of that stage win.